Well, I've always been interested in painting what's modern, what's to do with <clears throat> uh, urban advancement, and I've always been interested in nature as well. And so, um, and furthermore, I've also been interested in depicting movement and speed and chaos. And so the reflections, the glass surface provides the perfect situation to include multiple images at once, distortions of space uh, to depict movement. Um, and so you can include many sorts of ideas and themes all in one image without having to fragment or abstract it in a otherwise um, illegible way. I want the paintings to still be legible, but yet unstable, and so the glass surface provides that. But it's just about looking, really. Uh, and looking at a reflection can be fairly fascinating if you spend long enough looking at it. Um, but none of these paintings are singular moments in time. They are amalgamations of several moments. Well, my dad's an artist. I've grown up around art. He was there to provide technical advice and conceptual uh, backgrounds and, and just in terms of discussing ideas and just talking about art a lot um, was fairly critical, I'd say. And so therefore, through him, there's also been exposure to other artists and looking at art and just being around art all the time has been the main influence, I would say. What's next is moving to Europe. Um, I'm going to go work there for a while, going to Finland, going to Berlin, and uh, hopefully gain some exposure over there. fourth generation in my family. Eric is a fifth generation in the family. So we didn't really choose to be a painter. It just came automatically. Some sirens later on in the street. You can see this is Curtis mm -hmm. and Monty. And there's a tree in there too in, in the background. He paints totally different than a lot of other artists, even realism way. I, I never seen any young man painted that way. I'm happy um, he learning to see the world most people never see. I think he have a great start into his career.
Berlin is a very relaxed, casual city, perhaps the most relaxed, casual city there is in Europe in terms of big cities. Uh, so you do, you do learn a bit in that sense of just comparing and contrasting to other places that I've lived or visited, and uh, you realize that the world can be a lot more relaxed. There's hundreds of small, tiny little art spaces that pop up uh, in, in a hole in a wall, practically. It, you know, there's all these independent art galleries um, that aren't tied to any kind of uh, outside entity. They're run maybe by one person, maybe by two people, a small curatorial team. There's more of an emphasis on experimentation, I think, in a place like Berlin. Um, it, you, see, you see a lot of bad work in Berlin, an enormous amount of bad work, but you also see a lot of really good work uh, because it's essentially, it's a factory. It's the factory floor where things are tried out and tested. It's, it's the test lab. It's the, you know, uh, it's the place where th things that become successful elsewhere crawl out of. I think probably actually Berlin was the most impressive city in terms of how people live in the world. People living in the world in Berlin uh, was impressive because it was less rigorously regimented. London is an impressive city for exactly the opposite reason. It's entirely top-down and everybody there is there for some sort of economic gain of some sort. Um, and so you see that in how people dress and, and just the, the uh, hustle and bustle on the street. People are very impatient. Um, but it gives it kind of a fun, exciting atmosphere. The location I visited most was London. London almost became uh, a trip that I did maybe three times a year uh, when I was living in Berlin. I had a gallery, I had some connections there. But, but yeah, there's a lot to see and learn in London. It's sort of a, not a second home because I never lived there, but a place that I became very, very familiar with in terms of how it moves around and the spaces that you encounter when you're there. And it became a fertile place. Before I left Montreal, the, the art scene here was pretty, maybe one or two dimensional. So there was the commercial gallery scene, 
There was a few artist-run centers, in other words, non-commercial spaces. Uh, but these were very much tied to uh, like a structure of um, government subsidies. And now there's more and more popping up, these small little spaces, um, which is maybe a response to the internet as well. That's how they promote themselves, is through the internet, because they don't have any funding for the most part. Uh, the internet is free promotion for them. And word of mouth. The art community in Montreal isn't so large that uh, word takes a while to spread. You can generally find out about things quite quickly. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of these kind of Berlin style, if you can call it that, independent art spaces that pop up here and there in Montreal. And they open and they close, but they're not uh, commercial spaces. So maybe the work's for sale, but it doesn't have to be. And they don't pay the artist to show like some of these artist-run centers which receive government funding and have a mandate to pay the artists, which is, which is great, of course, but um, it also tends to create a program of exhibitions that are a bit... Maybe they start to look the same after a while, whereas some of these smaller independent spaces have, a, have the liberty to not worry about uh, what kind of work they're showing because they're not needing any funding to exist so they can do whatever they want and so the work that's shown maybe can be a bit more experimental and diverse and uh, they're not beholden to anybody. So I suppose that's it's nice to see and it is inspiring in some ways because it seems like there's more possibilities than there were before. people that buy because they like the art, because they love the artwork that they're buying, and then there's people that buy uh, as an investment. And they don't, they might like the art, but they don't really necessarily care one way or the other. Um, and of course there's museums and other institutions that buy works, uh, corporations. The internet is essentially taking away a lot of their sales. People don't go into these galleries to actually see the works and they sometimes buy directly through the artist. Um, what it's also doing is it's allowing artists to rely less on a gallery system so they can promote themselves via social media, Instagram, Facebook, these sorts of things. Um, and other sorts of, there's a lot of online submission processes to various exhibitions and uh, things of this sort, independently curated shows. and. Uh, so it's changed, in, changed the art world significantly in that way. Uh, the internet does in some capacity, at least, is it encourages people to take part. I went to art school. I went to actually, the first sort of art school I went to, if you can even call it that, is I went to a high school that focused on the arts. So I was in program there where you had an art class every morning uh, before the normal school hours, so about an hour I think, an hour and a half before you'd go in early and uh, the art class would start. Um, and then yes, I went to university for art and after that did a master's in painting. So I'm technically speaking, I'm educated in art making, though one wonders what that means exactly. It, it's, it's hard to really say. They don't teach you how to make things there. They sort of teach you how to think about making things. Uh, but the making, you can't really teach the making. I go running, which is a good way to bring some energy into the day, plus I enjoy running. Um, and then I'll cycle to the studio, and usually get there around 10 in the morning, somewhere between 10 and 
and I'll stay until sometime in the evening. At uh, some point, I go home for dinner. But uh, that's the general routine, and I do that five to six days a week. You can't do it every day because you go nuts. You have to have distance. Mostly, I have a method that I know kind of works well enough for me, which is I'll come up with an idea. So something will become exciting. It'll seem like a great idea. And so I'll do a lot of sketches and a lot of uh, preparatory work, a lot of sorting through photographs, which is where I get a lot of the visual detail that goes into the work. Um, and so then once I have an idea kind of formulated, I'll put it aside for a couple months and not really look at it too much. And then after a couple months, if I come back to it and it still seems interesting and there's still something to dig into, uh, then, I'll, then I'll start considering how to make it into a, an actual proper work. I paint these with intensity, but I do it with ice going through my body at the same time, ice water in my veins. Uh, I'm not an emotional painter, so I'm channeling things, I suppose, in a very kind of studious sort of a... a uh, it's hard to say because there's a bit that, there's a lot of it that's intuition and then there's a lot of it that's planned and thought out and then I sort of can think about what kind of a concept will it be when I put all this work together and try to show it as a group. Both the London and the Ottawa show were about works that dealt with urban space in different ways, mind you. The one in London was much more advanced, in a sense. It was much more complex. The works were uh, far more rigorous, in a sense. Um, which, which doesn't necessarily mean they were better. They were just different, I guess. Uh, but what, what, what happened was, after painting cities for about a decade, I had fantasies of painting trees and green things. And, um, but, you know, that can become a pretty generic cliche of someone going back into nature and all this sort of thing. Uh, and I'd always had an interest in nature. All my urban paintings had some sort of reference to nature, whether it was in the structure of the painting or in a literal visual reference or in a metaphor or some sort. Um, but I wanted to really think about nature as a space, as it exists within an urban space. Uh, nature tends to have a much more chaotic kind of structure to it. So the, uh, the ability to just sort of invent form and go with the flow, so to speak, to use a cliche, is, is much more uh, intuitive, I guess, when painting natural subject matter. I'm interested in shapes that bump into other shapes, uh, colors that interact, edges that create interesting intersections. I, I use the subject matter as an alibi for creating shapes on canvases. It's, it's there sort of as evidence, but not much else. general idea of what I'm going to do 
with the next painting and just a very foggy idea of what happens after that because whatever happens during the process of the next painting uh, entirely allows the possibilities of whatever comes after it to exist. So I do have big plans, um, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's hard to articulate because it all, it happens as it happens and I'm not really in control. I'm not really even that important. I just respond to the colored dirt that's moving around on a cloth. I just respond to that and it does what it does. And that force and I have a relationship of sorts, but it's a give and take. It tells me what needs to happen, but uh, I can't force it. traveling back to Berlin in October and maybe talking to a few people there as well, seeing about um, other kinds of possibilities that can move things forward over there. Um, I had a gallery there, it closed, so uh, there was supposed to be a show planned in that space. Part of my reason for going there in October is to see what's possible on that front as well. so much for being here. So uh, the Bombay Sapphire Artisan Series aligns perfectly with Artsy's mission to expand the art market and support more art and artists in the world. It's been a wonderful experience to work with Eric on this exhibition. Um, Eric is based in Montreal, for those of you who don't know, and from the moment that we saw this painting, Abstract Paradise, in the Montreal semi-final exhibition, it was very clear that this was the work of a talented, dedicated, and ambitious artist. And we're very lucky that all the other judges in Montreal, and then the judges in Miami at the finals, agreed with us. All the work in this room dates from 2017 to 2019. And we invite you to, I know it's a crowded room, but we invite you to take some time with these works this evening. If not, then I invite you to come back during the run of the exhibition, which goes until June 27th. So without further ado, 
I would like to introduce, it's my honor to introduce, Eric Niemannen, the 2018 Bombay Sapphire Artisan Series Grand Prize winner. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I mean, it's wonderful to see everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Bombay Sapphire, of course, along with Artsy. Um, and specifically, I'd like to thank Matthew Israel, who curated the show and came to visit me in Montreal, and we've been talking about it for months now. And also, from Artsy, uh, Missy Meyer and Chris Omachi, who have been in contact with me throughout the past few months on a regular basis. So I'd like to thank them. Uh, it's really been an honor and a real pleasure and a surprise being a part of all this, winning the prize. Um, you never necessarily expect things like this to happen, but I've always wanted my work to be seen on a large scale in, in a city like this, so it's really a dream come true. And it's very fulfilling on a personal level, therefore, to see it all be shown in a space in, in Chelsea, um, on a grand scale. Great, All the works have a personal meaning to me, but ultimately I don't really matter in the grand scheme of it. Uh, I make the work for other people, essentially, that the work can find a personal connection of some sort, whether it's an idea, a memory, an experience, from the past to the future of the present. And painting is, it's a form of paradise. It's an Arcadia, it's something outside of the everyday. And that's extremely important now, more than ever really, to have something with quiet meaning to contemplate. And that provides possibilities. And ultimately that's my job, is to provide meaning and possibilities for everyone. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you all again for coming. Thank you. I'm not looking for personal acclaim. If I could fade into the background, I would. I want my works to stand for me. There's a lot of sacrifice that goes into being an artist. It's not a certain path, and success is a moving target. The experiences over the last years have been fuel for what's to come. But always, I'm looking to make the perfect painting, to see a bigger image, to have wider vision, to create something convincing based on my experiences of being in the world. I'm not interested in recreating the look of things, but of creating a new form from the ground up. The journey then is essentially an idealist one. In wanting to create the perfect painting, I have set up what is to an extent an unobtainable objective. Ultimately, I'm not seeking an image. I let that fall into place. The painting exists for itself, and it tells me what to do. Every artist is a little delusional. You can't do it without delusion. You have to think that there's something important about this. That it's more than just literal pigment on a cloth. Though it is.